We'll, uh, we'll start. Um, so first, we have a guest, uh, Aiden, who's from what's called the Advocacy Center here. Uh, he's just popping in, so I'm going to let him do his thing, and then, uh, then we'll start the course uh, formally. And I'll also be going over the academic code of conduct and things like that that he'll be covering. But why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Alex. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Aiden. I work with the CSU Advocacy Center. Um, we're a confidential service that helps students uh, with three uh, main areas of, uh, of issues. The first is student requests. So if, um, you know, examples of student requests are if you're sick and you need a med notation or a deferral notation, we can help you understand the distinctions, uh, you know, grade reevaluations. You wanna take extra credits if you're, you know, if you're crazy, uh, if you wanna, take credits at another university. All these things fall into the realm of student requests and we can help you, you know, we simplify that bureaucracy for you. Um, the other thing are violations of the academic code and the behavioral code of conduct. I'll mostly stick to the academic code because the behavioral code is, uh, you know, likely not to affect you as much. So there's an academic code of conduct. In it, it states uh, all of, you know, uh, what's, what is expected of you when it comes to academic integrity. Uh, there are articles and violations. Uh, you know, I would advise you to read it. You know, we get a lot of students who um, come in thinking that, oh, you know, they violated the code, but they didn't know about it. They didn't know that it was wrong, and therefore, you know, please dismiss the case. But no, you know, intention doesn't matter uh, in code violations. Or, you know, I once had a student come in who had generously shared a paper with someone else, and then that person just used that paper and everyone got punished you know one student got punished for unauthorized co collaboration the other one for unauthorized collaboration and plagiarism so you know I would advise you not to share your uh, paper but if you do write your name and say I do not allow you to you know to submit anything or use it so those are academic misconducts I advise you to read it we also help with behavioral code so if you know someone is harassing you or you know you know, treating you in a way, uh, you know, that is, in, you know, a way that is unwanted. Well, we also help you through those processes. There are informal complaints, formal complaints, there are hearings, and we kind of uh, navigate, help you navigate through that process. And finally, we have a commissioner votes. So if you need a document uh, attested, uh, you can come to us and it's free. Uh, all of this is uh, paid for by you. It's part of your tuition. So it's the CSU Advocacy Center. Uh, we're on the second floor. And we're really here to help you with your academics, with everything. Just come in, and uh, we're really, you know, we're glad to help. We have institutional knowledge. We know a lot of people in the university, so we can help push on certain people if there's a blockage for some reason. So, yeah, that's basically it. Are there any questions? CSU Advocacy Center. And uh, I'll leave some of my flyers. Uh, you, you want to write the sure. room number? Yeah. Uh, hall, second floor. You'll see us. We're uh, we have a big banner. So hall is this one. And this is Hall. And just quickly, there's another uh, advocacy center called the Student Advocacy Office. So, I mean, you could go to either one, but we're with the CSU, the Concordia Student Union, and we're a little bit more separate. There are two, because sometimes two students are, uh, you know, sometimes you have one student accused of another student of doing something, and they both get representations from our different offices. So, are there any other questions? Uh, that's it. Okay. Well, good luck with your academics and thank you, sir. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Have a good day. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's some flyers there. You can grab one on your way out. All right. So, welcome, everyone. This is uh, 6150 Security Evaluation Methodologies. Uh, the basic goal of this course is so that you, if say you go into industry or even if you're in academia or whatever, and someone hands you something and asks you, is this secure? you know kind of what you have to do, okay? It might take you a long time to answer that question, but at least you have a starting point, uh, you have some idea about uh, what you might want to do, okay? Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'll just go through like the logistics of the course outline and, and all of that type of stuff, take your questions about that, and then the lecture itself is short, so we will have a lecture at the end, uh, but it won't uh, consume 
more than half of the class, and then starting next week, we'll, we'll have fuller lectures. Um, OK, so first off, uh, the course website is on Moodle, uh, so you should have access to it. Uh, if you don't have access to it, uh, you're either not enrolled in the course or you've been waitlisted for the course, something like that. Uh, in that case, I can give you access. Uh, the best way to do that is to shoot me an email. Uh, you can find me just by Googling. I should say I'm Jeremy Clark, uh, pleased to meet you. And uh, you can call me Jeremy. I'm not that much older than you, maybe. I used to say that like 10 years ago, but now I don't know if it's true. Uh, or Professor Clark, if that doesn't make you uh, comfortable. Uh, and yeah, you can find my email and office hours and all that kind of stuff on, on the website. And uh, if you ever want to find your way back to Moodle, uh, you can also start on my website uh, to get it. Um, so anyway, shoot me an email with your uh, student ID and access to Moodle, and I'll, I'll add you. Mean I can't enroll you in the course, so that can only be done by the university itself. I don't have that power, uh, but I can certainly uh, add you to the Moodle so you can, you can follow what's going on. Okay, uh, so the first thing on the Moodle is the course outline, so I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on it. Okay, so we're going to have office hours. Uh, office hours are virtual, uh, so the Zoom link is back on Moodle itself um, here. So if you click on this, it will open up the Zoom room. So uh, I'll join around 2 o'clock. If there's people there, I'll, I'll talk to you, and then uh, if uh, no one's there or whatever, I'll leave after maybe 10 minutes or something like that. So if you want to catch me for sure, try and come right at 2 o'clock. Uh, the sessions are one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like a group chat. So uh, basically, you'll join. You'll be put in a waiting room. Uh, if you are stuck in the waiting room, it's probably because there's another student that I'm talking to. You, unfortunately, Zoom doesn't like show you like a queue, so you don't know where you are in line or anything like that. You just know that you're waiting. Um, but, but anyways, I'll, I'll eventually get to you. Uh, if you sign in and instead it says host hasn't started this call, that means I haven't started the Zoom. I might have forgotten. It's been known to happen. Uh, if you, and so just send me an email and uh, either I'll open the room for you or, or at least I'll schedule another appointment uh, to make up uh, for, for the office hours itself, okay? Uh, they're drop-in, meaning that like you don't have to email me ahead and say I'm coming to office hours or anything like that. You just, if you, if you decide to show up, you show up. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about whatever, if you have questions about the course or specific questions about your grades or anything like that, uh, we'll go through. Um, on the subject of grades, I'll say that the assignments will be marked by the TA. So you'll, you'll, any grade disputes you'll do with the TA, not with me. Uh, and then the exams, uh, I, I'll, I'll mark. Um, OK, uh, I think that's it. OK, so uh, in terms of students are sometimes stressed out, like do I need to know a lot of programming and coding, or do I have to know a lot of math, or like what, what do I need to know in order to do this course? And so I'd say this course is pretty accessible to anyone. Uh, it's good if you have like a basic background in sort of computers, uh, networks, like that kind of thing. Like you, you kind of are comfortable with technology. Uh, if you're coming, maybe you're a quality student uh, or you're in another department. Uh, I've had students that go through the program, fine. They come out the other end, but they might have to do some additional reading or things like that, okay? But uh, in general, especially if, if you are in the security side of things, you, there shouldn't be anything that you're not comfortable with at, at this point, okay? Um, the projects where you might display your talents at math or pro coding, but you don't have to. Uh, so you can do, we'll talk about the projects in a bit, uh, but, but they can be like basically however you want to do them is fine. Okay, uh, there's no textbook either. Uh, so actually the course, it's kind of broken up into small chunks and each chunk is a textbook. Uh, so instead of making you buy five textbooks, uh, I'll just base the uh, exams and things like that on the lectures themselves. And when I say the lectures themselves, I mean the things I say. I'll have slides or I might write things down. It's not just strictly what's written down, but it's also what I say. Um, and there's a bunch of additional material uh, for each lecture. So you can see like um, there might be a link to a paper or a link to some videos or an article or something like that. All of that stuff is optional, so it's not you don't have to read it. Uh, if I said something you didn't understand it, you might go there and, and see it. Uh, you might 
help you to have it explained in a different way by a different person. Uh, if you really like that topic, maybe you want to do a project on it. So then you might look at these additional resources. So they're just there mainly like this is where I got the stuff from. You can look at it, uh, but, but you won't be tested on anything that's in the additional materials that was not covered uh, in, the, in the course itself. So you can, you can ignore them if, if you want. Um, the lectures themselves, I, I used to handwrite them out. Last year I switched to slides, so I'm going to try to do slides. You'll be the first cohort that is 100% slides. So I'll post the slides uh, for every week. And I also am doing a recording, so my audio is recorded and the screen capture is also recorded. So you'll see me thumb through the slides as well. And I put that on YouTube. Uh, that is not a guarantee. So I, I do that, I try to do it. But every now and then there might be a glitch, like the file gets corrupted or uh, maybe the microphone didn't work or something like that. And so uh, if that happens, it's on you, okay? So it's not, I'm not guaranteeing you that I will do that. But uh, you know, like literally, like I've maybe lost two lectures in 10 years of teaching. So it, it almost never happens. Uh, but, but anyways, it's, uh, so I'll, I'll do my best on it, okay? Uh, and then those will get posted to Moodle. Usually takes me a day or two to, to get around to uploading it and editing it and things like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, I, let me go back to office hours and also mention that uh, during the breaks, first I'll cut the break out of the video. So if you come and you're talking to me like one-on-one, -on -one, it's not going to get recorded for everyone to hear. Uh, and secondly, you can come uh, during the break or you can come after class and, and ask me questions as well. So that's an alternative to office hours. Okay, uh, so the grading scheme is pretty standard, straightforward. The only unusual thing maybe is there's no midterm exam, so there'll just be one uh, final exam uh, at the end. Uh, the final exam will be in person. Uh, it will be set by the university. So the university will choose the time and the place of the final exam. Uh, the dates for the final exam period are on Concordia and I put them on Moodle. So they, it could be scheduled anywhere between December 6th and December 19th. So a lot of people want to travel uh, during the break. Uh, so if that's you, I encourage you not to book tickets and things like that that can't be refunded until you hear about when the exam is. Usually it's like end of October, early November when they'll post it. And as soon as they post it, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, and I'll put a link. I didn't do it, but I can put a link uh, to where you can find it. You can find it on the uh, ENCS website. I'll just show you where it shows up. So uh, this is, so it's called Graduate Resources. Anyways, it's in the video now. You can scroll back to this and, and, and see. Um, so they obviously don't have the exams for winter up yet, uh, but they, this is for summer too. Uh, but, but eventually they'll be posted here uh, and then you can see where they are. Sometimes it's like tentative and then they finalize it and things like that. So anyways, uh, the travel, I can't do anything. If you're traveling and the exam is there, I can't move the exam, I have no power over it. And, uh, and the university will not accept that as an excuse uh, for, for missing the exam either, okay? So just hold off uh, and then uh, until you know about the final. So uh, because there's no midterm, obviously the final will be comprehensive, so it will cover the, the whole course. Uh, I'll talk about the exam you know, in, the, in the courses leading up to it in the last couple lectures. Uh, a few things, uh, uh, in the past I've done mostly a mix of short answer and multiple choice uh, with a heavy emphasis on multiple choice, so a lot of it's uh, multiple choice. Uh, and uh, you can, bring a sheet of paper with anything you want written on it. Uh, so one piece of paper. And so that's like a cheat sheet. And so you don't have to memorize. So the questions I ask will not be a memorization. I won't ask you what are the six letters of stride stand for, which is something you'll see later today, okay? All of them will be conceptual. They'll be about applying the concepts from the course to like a new scenario, that, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, so, so just so that you don't feel stressed out about having to memorize things and remember terms and acronyms and things like that, uh, you can put whatever you want on the sheet. You can put, you can print out the lecture notes. You can print it out in fine point, you know, font and bring a magnifying glass, like whatever, whatever you want. Uh, it's not full-fledged open book because then people are like rifling through pages and flipping books and it gets really loud. Uh, so that's why it's limited to one page. But 
whatever is essential, uh, you should be able to, to squeeze onto a page. Um, there'll be a project. The project will be worth 30%, and I will talk about it when I'm through with the course outline. Uh, there will be two assignments. Uh, the assignments are not posted yet. They're penciled in from, from last term, but I, I'm not sure if I'll do the same ones or, or revise them. But um, I'm going to aim to have the first assignment due around the week of October 1st to 7th. Uh, which means that I will be giving it to you at least two weeks in advance. So somewhere around lecture three, uh, I'll be giving it to you. Probably will involve what we'll cover next class, evaluation frameworks, and it may cover a bit of what we uh, cover this class, uh, which is called Stride. Uh, so those are the two topics that we tend to cover with assignment one. And then assignment two will be due like toward the end of the course uh, and it will uh, cover what we call cognitive walkthroughs. Um, so it will probably be due around here. So those dates aren't guaranteed, but uh, I'll, I'll probably uh, try and follow that. Assignments are worth 10% each. I'll talk you through the logistics of uh, the assignments when I release it. Uh, they are individual, so you'll do them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whereas the projects you can choose to do it individually or in groups, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the course outline looks like this. I forgot that this term, it, we, we're switching to a 12 lecture term, so it used to be 13. Uh, you have a break uh, in the middle, so there's a reading week uh, in the middle of the fall term as well as in the middle of the winter term, which we've always had. Um, so this isn't exactly correct, but basically you can pretend that this lecture doesn't exist and, and then it's fine. Um, yeah, so there's some other additional reading you can you can read. So this has a lot to do with like COVID kind of stuff, and uh, these are the different student services. So including the the office that came today uh, to talk to you. Okay, uh, is there any questions about this so far? Don't be shy. Just, if you're thinking it, there's probably like 10 other people thinking it. Yeah. What is the size of the sheet? Uh, eight and a half by 11 inches. No bigger. <laughs> but it can be double-sided. I used to make it one side so you couldn't flip, but then one year I did double and it wasn't that loud. So it was fine. Yeah. I think right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. So the lectures will be posted on YouTube. Uh, the link to the YouTube will be from Moodle, but you could also find them, like they'll be public. And so you can find my YouTube channel and, and find them like, so you wouldn't necessarily have to go through Moodle, but uh, I'll have the link every week uh, in Moodle. And then uh, I put them in a playlist too, so you can see all the lectures. Yeah, and by the way, if you're interested, uh, you can, like if you want to like read ahead or something like that, um, you can find the lectures from, from last term. Uh, actually, the easiest way to do it is, so this, for example, are, are all the lectures from, um, from last time I taught it, which was in winter uh, of last year. So they're, they're all there. So that's what it will look like when it's done. OK, uh, any other course outline questions? Uh, probably not. Uh, so I, uh, let me just go back to the course outline. I used to, I, there is a sample, a set of sample questions that I used to post, but the course changed so much since then that almost like 75% of the questions are just not relevant. And then students get really confused and think they missed stuff and things like that. Um, and if I posted recent exams, then I would have to completely change the exam and then because I completely changed it, it wouldn't even be useful anymore. So, um, so yeah, let's just say no, no sample questions. But um, yeah, just uh, spend your time. Like doing sample questions are OK to reinforce whether you learn the material. Uh, but they're bad to study from because they make you think only about those questions. Whereas if, if I know you've seen a sample question, I'm definitely not going to ask that or even a simple variation on it, I'm going to try and ask something completely different. Yeah. This course is generally like kind of hard to test on uh, because there's a lot of like stories and examples and it's not like 
it's not like a standard course that kind of follows uh, like a textbook or, or something like that. So anyways. Okay, other other course outline questions? When's the time? Sorry, just in here, the first part. Is, like, how long is it? Uh, so usually they, they'll give you a three hour slot and I don't try to stretch it. Like sometimes you'll get an exam that you can barely finish within three hours. That's not the case. So usually my exam, I, I'll make it so that it should be completable within about two hours. You can sit there for the three hours and, and, and think. And the fastest student might leave after an hour or even less. Some might leave after 45 minutes or something like that. So if you really know what you're doing, you can just zip through it. And uh, if, you, um, if you want to spend the three hours thinking about it, you can. But it won't be one of those ones where it's like, like you're stressed out the whole time writing about it. It's, I want to give you time to think about it because it's a very conceptual based exam. Uh, so we'll talk about that closer to the exam. So it won't, it definitely won't be 100% multiple choice. There'll be at least a few short answer. Um, and so it'll be some blend. But last term I used like 80% multiple choice, 20% short answer or something like that. So I'll probably do something similar. Uh, it's easier to mark because the machine marks it. Yeah. So it'll be pen and paper. Purely conceptual. So you'll have your cheat sheet, you'll have a pen. Uh, you'll have a pencil because the pencil, the Scantron form requires a pencil. I'll be reminding you of that and I'll have extra pencils if you forget. Um, but, but anyways, and you can write the exam in pencil as well. Uh, it's actually better for you because then you can erase things if you, if you need to. Okay, so don't, anyways, don't stress about the final. We'll, you, you'll ask me all these same questions you know, in, in three months because you'll f have forgotten the answers. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about it again. Okay, so I'll, I'm gonna move on to the project then. Okay, all right, so the project is something that you'll do. Uh, it will be due on the last day of class uh, I may change this. I'll announce if I change it. Um, we have a system that we've used for collecting assignments. Uh, the problem with it is now they put it behind a VPN. So you have to like VPN into Concordia or be on campus. Then you can use the system. And students, like anyways, the first assignment was a disaster. Like half of the students couldn't access it. Then, then they got used to it and then it wasn't a problem going forward. But I might just switch it to Google Drive or or something like that. So I'll give you a place to upload your file. Uh, and this isn't due for a long time, so I, I'll, I'll have it in place uh, for assignment one, and then we'll use the same thing for the course. Um, yeah, and it just tells you how to name the file and, and things like that. So these details don't really, uh, you don't have to worry about. Okay, the uh, project will be a written report only. Okay, so it's just, there's no, like, I don't know, software or like you don't build a device or anything like that, okay? It's just a written report. If you do other stuff like that, like say you write some code, you'll just link to the code from the paper, but I'm only going to read the paper itself, okay? Um, and uh, you can do uh, one of, most students do one of two things. Okay, so one is like, if you're really keen, you might have a novel security idea that no one's thought of before. So that's great. You can do a, a project on that. Uh, or you can try and tell me about things that already exist, like other, so we call that systemization of knowledge. So it's knowledge that's already out there. What you're doing is you're sort of editing it or curating it or filtering it and giving it to me in a pre presentable, digestible form. Um, the only requirement for the course is, uh, well, first it's a security course, so it has to be about security, but to differentiate it from all the other security courses that you're probably taking, uh, there should be a component of evaluation in it somehow, somewhere, okay? So this course is about evaluation. You might not know what evaluation means yet, but as we go through the course, you'll, you'll start to get a better feel for what it is. You don't have to use something directly from the course, so it can be something that's not covered in the course, but evaluation is basically like, first off, what does it mean to be secure? Like, what's the definition of security? And that's going to change depending on what you're talking about. 
And then how do you figure out that it's secure? Or, you know, you read a paper and people said it was secure. Well, what did they mean and how did they figure it out? And how do you know they're not wrong, right? And how do you know they didn't miss things, right? So that's sort of the evaluation part of security, okay? So you might look at a methodology itself. You might look at your favorite topic and then apply a methodology to it. Uh, you might take one of the methodologies that you'll use in the assignments uh, and you might really like the assignment and then decide, oh, I'm going to do a project. I'm just going to do a bigger and better version of sort of what we did in the assignment. Um, you know, it's, it's whatever, okay? Um, so yeah, yeah, and I'm here to help. So we'll keep revisiting this project topic and uh, as you have ideas, you'll come like during break or after class and we'll talk about it. And uh, I have some tips uh, down here. Um, So there's one tip that just came to my mind. I don't know if I wrote it down, but generally I'll, I'll say it and then I'll update the document if it's not there. Um, try and pick the narrowest topic possible, okay? It's better to do a deeper dive on something narrow than something too broad, okay? So the, the main thing is people will say, they'll be like, oh, I wanna look at the security of cloud computing. That's like huge, right? Like there's, there's entire conferences that are just about the security of cloud computing. Right, so you, you have to pick something like really narrow, like, like what exactly is it uh, that you're studying and don't look at five different things, look at one thing, okay? Don't do five different methodologies on the same thing, just do one and do it well, okay? So uh, the, the more focused and narrow your project is, usually the, the better it is. And then I, I have some other tips I'll, I'll get to in a second. Okay, uh, logistically you can work on it individually you can work on it with other colleagues. Uh, maximum size is four by default. So if you have a group up to size four, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you really want five or six people, I'm not saying you can't do it, just come. All these rules can be broken if you talk to me, okay? If you give me a good reason for why you want something different, then you sh I'll accommodate it. But anyways, by default, you don't have to talk to me ever uh, or ask anything. You can, you can work on it individually, groups up to four. Um, the, uh, when I look at the report though, I do take into account how many students are on it, okay? So if it's a project that looks like it could have been written by one student, but there's four names on it, then the mark is going to reflect that, all right? Um, so, uh, so, so I do expect more. The, the size of the report will always be the same. So it's always gonna be eight pages, up to eight pages. You can write less if you want. Um, so you do more people, you do more work, that's fine. You just have to write it more densely. Okay, you have to, um, you know, have pointers to what you did rather than exactly what you did or, or whatever uh, the case may be. Okay, um, so anyway, so, so up to eight pages. Template, I don't care, whatever, like as long as it's not unreasonable. Use the default word. If you use LaTeX, use a default LaTeX template. It doesn't matter. If you want to make it double columns because you can fit more stuff on a page, that's fine. As long as it looks reasonable. Uh, hopefully you'll be reading some academic papers. You can also look at how they're like kind of like what they look like. If you really like the template of a, a paper, you can go to the conference that published the paper and they'll have on their website the template for it. So you'll just download a, 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 a Word file and it will already be in that template. Or you, if you use LaTeX, uh, they'll have these uh, class files uh, for it. Um, I don't need a cover page, uh, so just uh, just put the title and all the authors and student numbers on the first two lines, and then you can just jump right into the, the uh, report itself. Uh, I don't care about structure, like introduction, conclusion, like whatever. Again, just look at academic papers, okay? You'll be reading them anyway. You'll see they almost all use more or less the same structure. Find a structure you like and copy it, and it's fine. There's no marks associated uh, with structure. Um, okay, the, the final thing is uh, you should review, so this is what the advocate said as well, um, you should review what plagiarism is, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on this. So there is a, there's a website that explains uh, everything, all the details that you want to know. Um, okay, so plagiarism is basically uh, uh, when you copy material from somewhere else. Okay, uh, simply put. Uh, there's other academic offenses you might commit like copying off of someone else's assignment or during an exam, copying off of someone else's sheet. 
Those are also academic offenses, but I'm not going to talk about them now because this is just about the project. The main thing with the project is that you um, either find like a, a paper online and you copy it into your report and present it as if it's your report as, it, as opposed to someone else's, or uh, you have a copy of maybe a student that took the course uh, in previous terms or things like that, and then uh, copy material from it or things like that. And I've had students, and I have like PDFs of basically all the reports going back since I started teaching. Um, so um, I, keep, I keep everything. Anyways, uh, so, so yeah, so, so don't worry about, or don't try and do that. Um, uh, and it has been done before. Um, okay, so, so this is my advice on plagiarism. So first off, I don't want to scare you away from using other resources, right? You're going to write a report on something. Probably sitting here today, you don't know the content that you're going to tell me in the report. That means you learned it, right? You learned it from somewhere. You learned it because you read other stuff. That's what you're supposed to be doing, okay? So you're supposed to be reading other stuff taking the knowledge from the other stuff and putting it in your report, okay? And that's not plagiarism, that's what you're supposed to do, okay? So it's sort of a fine line uh, between it. Um, but basically what you should do is, A, never copy and paste text directly from one source into your document, even if you intend to rewrite it, just don't do it. Uh, the better way to do it is just read it, understand it, close it, so get it out of mind, and then just sort of say it in your own words as if you're telling someone else uh, what that paper was about without actually explicitly rep like looking at it, okay? Uh, second thing is uh, cite that you took the idea from that paper, okay? I'm not strict on how it looks. I don't care how the citation looks. I don't care about the format of the citation. As long as I can look at the citation and know I can find the paper, which you can pretty do easily do from Google, even if I just have the title or something like that, that's fine, okay? Um, so the citation is fine. And the other thing is when you write, you can write in what we call a conversational style. So conversation is just like you're talking to me, right? So like, for example, let's say that there's a list of five properties and you're going to tell me what those properties are in your own words, but that list of five properties you did take from this paper. So you're like, I don't know how to cite it. Like, do I put it at the end of the list or the start of the list? And then do they think it's a direct quote? Like, so just tell me in the writing. So you'll just say, hey, these, this people, citation five, came up with a list of five things. These are what they are, okay? So just from reading the sentence, it's clear to me, okay, this list came from this paper, okay? So whatever, how, whatever you want to communicate about why you're citing it, you can put into the writing of the paper itself, okay? So you don't have to write in a really lofty, like, academic, like, style. And actually, if you get into academic papers, you find that people do that all the time. They're just like, the, the authors of five do this, and the authors of six do this, and it's a very like, kind of conversational style, okay? Um, so that's fine, so, so you can do citations. Uh, if you really want to directly quote something, that's fine, but you use quotation marks, okay? But that's like very unusual, uh, usually in academic papers you're not, uh, usually you might quote something if you want to criticize it, but often you're not just repeating uh, things uh, that are written. But anyways, if you, it's in quotation marks with the citation, then I understand that this is text that was lifted verbatim out of uh, other papers, okay? So you should cite it. Um, any graphics or figures that you use, you should also cite where they come from. But better yet, you should redraw them, okay? Usually it doesn't take that much time. If you redraw it yourself, then you can communicate, you can put the emphasis on what you want to say, which might be different than what they were trying to say with it. And then you should still cite it. You can just say adapted from and then give the citation or, or something like that, okay? Um, last thing, uh, this is where like, uh, so I, I sit on, I sat on what's called tribunal. So this is like where the plagiarism, plagiarism is a whole thing and it's taken very strictly by the way. So like uh, if you, um, uh, the default punishment for doing it twice uh, is expulsion. Uh, from the university. So usually the first time there's some sort of warning, but then the second time it's just, I'm not saying that everyone gets expelled that does it twice, but that's the default. It's up to the provost to decide. And there's kind of like a hearing, like a trial or whatever. And so I've been like a judge on that trial. It's called tribunal. So I see a lot of these cases go through. And um, the most common style, the most common way, like sometimes you plagiarize and you know it, like you just ran out of time, whatever. Okay. And I'm here to tell you it's better to take a zero than it is to plagiarize. Because if you plagiarize, you're going to get worse than a zero, 
in the end, okay? Like your grade could be worse, like it could actually be a negative grade. They might, you might fail the whole course even if you pass with everything else. Um, and, uh, and then there's like other like punishments and things like that, that, that might happen. So it's better to just take a zero uh, than to, to attempt it. But um, uh, the second kind of plagiarism that's the most common where the student like maybe actually doesn't know that they're plagiarizing, but the university considers it plagiarism, is if you copy and paste text, but you rewrite it grammatically. So like you take the text and then you change, you know, they say he's running there and you're like, oh, he's sprinting there. And, you know, like you kind of change words and things like that. OK, but the meaning of the text is there. The logic behind it is there. The structures, the ideas are still there. You, you, you can do that without understanding what you wrote. You could take some text, not even understand what it means. You could change all the grammar around and present it. And, you, you know, it doesn't prove that you actually know what you're, you're talking about, right? So anyways, that, that is considered plagiarism as well, okay? So uh, rewriting text, uh, you know, so it's not just if it's exactly the same, okay? So what you wanna do really, I, I strongly emphasize it, is when you're taking ideas from other places, don't even have that text open looking at it, you know, uh, just try to explain it in your own words and then give a citation for where this idea came from. Okay. The other thing that students sometimes don't want to do is they think it looks weird if there's a, too many citations in a paper. There's never too many citations in a paper. Okay. A lot of academic papers, there's a citation after almost every sentence, especially in these like kind of survey kind of papers where you're summarizing what other people have said. You'll go through the paper and, and every sentence or at least every paragraph has a couple citations. Okay. That's a very typical academic style and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Um, so I'm not expecting you to tell me new ideas, right, that, that you dreamt up yourself. I'm expecting you to have gotten these ideas from somewhere. And so by citing, you're just, you're telling me where it came from, but it's not unusual or, or anything like that. Or you're not going to get a bad grade uh, because there's too many citations. Okay. So uh, go ahead, be liberal uh, with the citations. Um, and just, when you're in doubt, just you can cite it. Um, and if you... Like say there's a paragraph and you don't want to put a citation after every sentence because it's a citation to the same thing. That's again where you just switch to telling me in conversational style. Like the ideas in this paragraph are from this and then blah, and then you go. Um, okay, okay. Uh, is there a question so far? Okay, I'll, I'll pause at the end too. You can, you can think about them. Okay, the, the following are just kind of like tips. Um, so they're kind of like, these are things that I see, patterns I see uh, in projects that get good grades. So the first thing is that if you're writing about other people's research, uh, there's two styles of papers that you might write. So one of them we call like a survey, and one of them we call a systemization of knowledge. I want you to do an SOK. I do not want you to do a survey. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain what the difference is. So a survey would be, I pick my topic, whatever, cloud security, uh, certain kinds of attacks in cloud security or whatever, right? And then I go to Google Scholar and I find five papers and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do my report on these five papers. And then my report is sort of like, paper one says this, paper two says this, paper three says that, okay? That's a survey style, okay? I don't want that because I want to know the idea. I don't want to know what other people said. It's useful. Surveys are useful if you write a thesis or something like that. You, it's important to attribute like who came up with this idea and, and all that type of stuff. That's not the point of this course. The point of this course is the ideas themselves. Okay. So I, I don't. I care that you cite where you got the ideas from, but I don't care where you got them from. Okay. So what I want you to do instead is start with the topic, and when you have the topic. Whatever you're reading in order to explain that topic to me, you're citing it, okay? But other than that, it's sort of invisible, like whether you use two papers or five papers or seven papers or whatever, okay? So you don't orient it around uh, the papers itself, okay? The other thing about uh, systemization of knowledge is authors will, will only say certain things. They won't give you the complete picture, okay? There's a couple of reasons why. One is maybe they're manipulating you. It's not sort of rare, but maybe they're trying to present the best, you know, put their best foot forward. And so if there's some drawbacks of the system, they're not going to highlight it in their paper. Okay. A second bigger factor is just chronology. 
So like they wrote a paper in 2006, but then in 2008, there was this big idea that they didn't know about. And now we're here and you know, we don't know if you apply that big idea from 2008 to what they did in 2006, they're silent on that, obviously. And so that's where you step in as the author and the curator. And so you, you're going to tell me, well, you know, what, what they would have said if they knew about the things that were developed since then type of thing. Okay. Um, so anyway, so your job is to give me a complete view of the topic. Okay. And it doesn't, it shouldn't be temporal. It shouldn't be based on who wrote what paper when it's just like, it's more like a textbook. Like you're trying to explain it uh, to someone else. And the person reading, if you're a student and you're reading a textbook, you don't care if what papers they came from, or you don't care that this idea came out in 86 and this idea came out in 94 or whatever. Like you just want to know what the ideas are. Okay. So think of a, you can think of an SOK more like a textbook chapter as opposed to like, here's five papers and what they say. All right. Um, Okay, so another way, this is another way of looking at the differences between the two. Um, pretend that I'm going to read your paper. I've read all the citations in your paper. Okay, I probably haven't, but just pretend it. Okay, so I've read them all, uh, so that's fine. So I don't need a summary of what are in all those papers. I've already read them. Okay, does that mean you can't tell me something new? You absolutely can. You could compare two things that haven't been compared, right? Uh, you can compare something that was written in 96 with something that was written in 2000 and the people in 96 didn't know about the thing in 2000 so they never compared themselves right maybe there was a backwards comparison but the authors were just you know trying to enhance the highlights of, of what they did and not what the other people did or whatever you can offer a fair comparison okay so that's something that you can do right uh, you can explain things in a different way right you can look for different ways of looking at it um, you can explain it in a simpler way right sometimes papers are so complicated there's a lot of math and things like that, and you just want a simple explanation. That's another thing a textbook does, right? It doesn't give you all the details, right? It goes through, it edits them, and says these are the three important details, okay? So there's still a lot that you can do even if you assume that I've already read it, okay? Um, but I don't want a summary of all the papers. I want like some new perspective or some new way of looking at it, uh, that type of thing. Um, in terms of the papers that you're looking at, I, I have said papers a lot, so this is academia, so we focus on academic papers. Uh, it doesn't have to be academic papers. Uh, it can be blog posts, it can be technical documents, it can be source code, you know, whatever, basically whatever you need to look at to learn the things that you're looking at, then that's fine, okay? So I, I really want you to choose the topic first, and the topic's going to lead you to what you need to read in order to understand the topic, okay? Some topics, it will be rooted in academia. Some topics are too new. Maybe there's no academic papers on it yet, or it's not covered, or it's more of an industry concern. So you're gonna be reading other stuff. That's fine. I don't, I don't care where it comes from. Uh, the, the main thing though, is just to make sure you're not missing academic papers. So I do want you to at least try and see that there are some, okay? Uh, and the second thing is you should do a bit of quality control. So not just, just because you read it on the internet doesn't make it true, okay? Academic papers are sometimes wrong. Uh, and usually not in good quality venues, but it's hard for you sitting there to know, oh, this is a good quality venue or this is a not so good quality venue. Blog posts might be right, they might be wrong, right? If it's a Google engineer talking about Chrome, it's probably right, right? If it's someone you know, that's non-technical trying to summarize something else, then it might have errors in it. Okay, you, you, you never know. All right. Um, when you look at other people, you should also do it critically. So you should um, like do compare and contrast with what the other authors are saying. Don't take everyone's word for it. Um, you might think that there's weaknesses that the authors don't highlight in your report. You can highlight those weaknesses. Okay, so you're, you're not just, you know, reading these papers and assuming they're true and assume that they're the greatest thing and everything the author says is true, right? And then just repeat it as if that's the truth, okay? Um, and so you wanna think critically about it and skeptically even about it and, and really, you know, think about like, is, is what they're saying really true? Um, you know, and so, yeah. Okay, topics, uh, I tend not to give a list of topics because you can, security like cuts through so many things, right? Like there's like pick your favorite thing, even if it has nothing to do with maybe it's not a technical thing, you know, like I like, I don't know, soccer, 
you could do a security of soccer paper, I'm sure, or like VAR or something like that. I don't know. Like, like anything that you're interested in, you can find like some intersection of security. So I really don't want to limit you. And sometimes the like more wacky, like esoteric topics are, are the more fun projects uh, to read. So you can do whatever you want. Um, but if you're really stuck and you're not sure, uh, these are the top four security conferences. And so they each hold, they hold an event every year, all four of them. So there's four events every year between these four conferences. Each of these events publishes around maybe 100, 200 papers. Some of them publish more. Um, and so there's, yeah, so there's about 1,000 papers that come out every year at these four events, okay? And you also don't have to pick something new. You can find some cool idea from the 90s that everyone forgot about. Um, but anyways, you can go through them and you obviously aren't going to read a thousand papers, right? So what you do is you just look at the titles and you're like, oh, that title looks interesting. That title looks interesting. Now you have, I don't know, 50 titles. Then you read 50 abstracts. So abstracts are something that every academic paper has. You don't need one for your report. You can do one if you want. Um, but it's basically like a 200 word summary of what the paper is about. And then you read the abstracts and you're like, oh, that it sounded interesting from the title, but now it sounds kind of boring and you throw them out and then maybe you're left with four or five like abstracts. And then with those, you might go and look at the papers themselves and hopefully one of them like sort of grabs you and, and you're really interested in it. Once you have that sort of toehold, like I, I want to do a project in around this, it's interesting to me. Then you can look at, you can start with that paper. Uh, every paper will have a related work section that says, what are all the papers before this paper was written? that have to do with the same topic, okay? So they'll give you a summary and they'll give you a list of references so then you can look at those. And then all the papers that were written since that paper, it's a little harder to find, but it's not that hard. What you'll do is you'll go to Google Scholar. Uh, you'll type in the name of the paper, it will come up. And then it, Google Scholar will tell you how many people have cited that paper, meaning like papers that were written generally after um, uh, that, that cited this paper. And then it will give you a list of them as well. And so then you can go through those and see if there's anything uh, that, that does it. Google Scholar is also useful if you, say you're reading a paper and you're like, eh, I don't know if this is a good paper or not. You can look on Google Scholar, see how many citations it gets. It's not an ironclad rule, okay? Like sometimes there's good papers that don't have any citations. Sometimes there's bad papers that have a lot. But if you see something like 50, 100, or, or more than 100, it's probably a good paper, okay? Uh, if you see three citations and when you click on it, it's only the author's future papers, you know, citing their previous papers, then it might not be a good paper, okay? Uh, and so, so anyways, that's, that's something that you can also use to just as a kind of basic quality control. If it's a brand new paper, it won't have any citations yet, okay? So then if you're like, oh, this seemed like a really good paper, but it doesn't have any citations, maybe it's not, but it just came out like a month ago, then that, that explains it as well, okay. Um, you can also just search through Google Scholar, so you can type in keywords and things like that and, and, uh, and go through. Uh, Google, like Google, the search engine works really well where it, it tends to give you the best pages at the top. Google Scholar, I feel like, doesn't. So like, it often picks really weird papers and presents them first. So like, it's, it's not like Google itself where like the top results are, are what you're looking for. Uh, it's something where you, you you could benefit from going through four or five pages of results, like looking for, for exactly what you're looking for. Okay, I'm here to help. Uh, so if you have questions about your topic, uh, if it's a quick question, you can email me, you can come to office hours, you can ask me during break, you can ask me after class. Um, I, yeah, I'll take a look at it, I'll discuss it. Um, you don't have to talk to me ever. So there's no, you don't have to tell me who your group is. If you're working in a group, you don't have to tell me what your topic is. You don't have to register your topic. There, there might be multiple people that do the same topic. That happens a lot. Uh, that's not a problem, okay? So as long as the PDF comes in when it's due, then that's it, okay? So we, we never have to have a conversation. There's no deliverables. But that said, I, I am here. It's not because I don't want to talk to you. It's just that, you know, sometimes groups change or topics change and, you know, sometimes people wait till like a week before to choose their topic, which you should not do because it's, um, it's going to be very, the, the, your level of stress is really going to go up as the term because you're going to have projects in all your courses and you're going to have finals and, you know, it's going to get really crazy. So the more you can do ahead of time, um, the better, you know, if, if you could do your whole project in the next month or two, you would, 
you'd be a very happy person come the end of the term. But I, I get why that's like hard to do. Easier said than do. Done. Uh, the one thing I won't do is sometimes students are like, can I send you a draft of my report and can you read it and give me feedback? I can't do it because it's too much. If everyone sent me a draft, it, already reading the reports is a lot of work, right? Like even at eight pages, sometimes we have 100 students, so it could be, if everyone did it individually, that'd be 800 pages I have to read in like a two week window because everyone wants their marks right away, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, but it's usually less because people work in groups and things like that. But the point is that I can't read drafts from everyone, okay? So if you send me a draft, I won't read it. Um, what I'll do at most is look at it for two minutes. So I'll put it in front of me and whatever I can see in two minutes, I'll tell you. Uh, but uh, anything beyond that, like obviously I'm not actually reading, I'm just sort of looking at pictures and looking at headers and things like that. Um, I can't offer you like, like I won't catch like little things uh, in your report uh, based on that. Okay, uh, one other that's like really in the tip category, you don't have to do this, but it works well, is if you think of your topic like a question, okay, like a security question that someone might have, like what is the best way to do whatever, or like what's the most secure way, or you know, what's the trade-offs with this, or I don't know. But like if you, if you can get it phrased in a question, then you can, A, you can always make it a narrower topic by narrowing the question. And secondly, it gives you a very natural, um, like, what do I include in the report? Well, if it's not helping you answer the question, then you don't, re you don't include it, okay? So it gives you natural boundaries in terms of this should go in the report or this shouldn't go in the report, okay? And maybe you answer the question in four pages and you're like, now what? Then ask a second question and write another four pages about it. Or, or then maybe you broaden the question or you go deeper on the answer, uh, you know, depending. But anyways, uh, phrasing your, your project report as a question is, is usually, you, it puts you on a good path uh, to doing a good project that, that makes sense. Uh, references can be in any format uh, as long as you, you use them. Uh, security is broad. Like I said, there's lots of different aspects of security. So you can be creative. And I like things that are, are weird or unusual that I haven't read five times already. Um, so yeah. Uh, the grading uh, is out of 50. So I'll just sort of briefly state what I look at. Um, so scope and execution is sort of like what did you choose as your topic? Was it a good topic? Did your report stick to the topic? Did you start going on bunny trails and explaining things that didn't really have to do uh, with, with the project itself? Is it organized? Is it logical? Like why this section goes here and you sort of take me you know, through it. And so this is where like answering a question will, will kind of really help you uh, with this, but you don't, you don't have to strictly do it, um, but, but that's the type of thing. Um, it should be complete, it should be comprehensive. Uh, and then also I'm looking for some evaluation component to, to the report as well. Uh, interpretation is sort of like, I'll read your report and think, did the student really understand what they're telling me? That's basically more or less what it boils down to. So it's actually easy to like just repeat things that you read. I'm, I'm not talking about plagiarism, like you're, you're rewriting them and you're, you're phrasing it yourself and things like that. You're not plagiarizing. But you know, you can tell me about, like I don't know anything about kernels, but if I had to like write something about them, I could read a bunch of stuff and like repeat some of the words and the terms and things like that and maybe sound like I know what I'm talking about, okay? So interpretation, it's hard to like say how I can do it, but like just, I, I don't know, I've read so many of these reports and things, I just kind of get a feel for like, oh, this seems like, if you explain something like in a completely new way or a way that's really unique to you, then that like is a really good indication that you understood it, right? Or if you're able to, actually, if you're able to drop details, that actually is also a good thing. Like if you're able to like read it and simplify that concept and explain it in a simpler term that's still accurate, that's a really good indication that you really understood it because simplification is actually a really hard uh, way of doing it. If you are sort of like really light on details and then you do really heavy on details and then light on details, that's sort of an indication that maybe you don't understand. Uh, you're just uh, sort of repeating things. So anyway, so that's sort of the, the, the point of interpretation. Uh, technicality is just, I want something that looks like a graduate. You're in grad school, uh, it should be technical. What technical means can differ, right? So it doesn't mean that there's a lot of math 
or there's code and programming or things like that, unless if that's your report. If you're doing something on cryptography, then I want to see some math. If you're, doing, if you're implementing something, then I want to see some discussion of the code and, and things like that. Um, but, but anyway, so, so this will differ, but technical just means that you're, you're precise. So even if you're just using, like explaining in English how things work, you're precise. When you need to go into the details, you don't shy away. You go into the level of detail. Uh, you don't skip over the hard parts, that type of thing. That's what makes a document technical, uh, even if it's not, you know, if it's not like code or, or math symbols and things like that. And then presentation, most people do well on this, uh, but basically like it should be, it should look nice, not nice like graphically, um, but um, it should be useful in terms of how it's organized. You should use figures when you need to use figures. Figures should be used to simplify things that are too complicated to explain in words. Uh, tables, if, if, if it calls for a table, you'll use it. Uh, your citations look good, um, as in you're citing a, in an appropriate way. Uh, it, it doesn't matter the format of, of the citations. Um, uh, another thing I, uh, yeah, okay. Um, what else on presentation? Uh, yeah, so the, the template itself doesn't matter. Oh yeah, the big one is uh, gramma grammar and spelling is not a thing, okay? So if I can read it and understand what you're saying, that's fine. I know that for a lot of grad students here, uh, English isn't your first language. I'm not out to mark your English, okay? So uh, you have tools, you have Grammarly, you have Word or whatever. They're going to do a lot of corrections and things like that. If typos slip through or grammar or things like that, like I just, I'm not, I don't care at all, okay? So I only care about, so don't spend your time spell checking your document. Spend your time, you know, reading your document to make sure that it, it's logical and well organized and things like that. Um, and then uh, deductions are, are, the main one is just like, uh, I might apply a deduction if there's like four people on a project and it looks like something that could have been done by one person. Or like I'm holding a project in my one hand that's done by one person and I'm holding one that's done by four people and they look the same. Like, uh, so that, that type of thing. I'm not trying to scare you away from doing working in groups. I'm just saying it is a factor. So a lot of people are nervous to work alone because they're like, okay, my friends, I don't know anyone in the class. Am I going to get a bad mark? You know, people who know people, they're going to have four people and things like that, okay? So I'm just trying to actually equalize. I'm not trying to punish you for working alone. I'm not trying to punish you for working in a group of four or three or two, okay? I'm just trying to make sure it's a level playing field uh, for everyone so you're not, you're not worried about it, okay? So I'm, I'm hitting a lot on, on bad things that big groups do, but, but anyways, there's a lot of big groups that do great projects uh, as well. And, um, Every year, the best project, there's no correlation that I can see, like uh, people who do it alone tend to get better marks or people that do it in big groups tend to get better marks. There's uh, the best projects like from last term that I can remember, some of them were solo and some of them were in groups of three or four. Yeah. Okay, uh, questions about the project? Yep, so the implementation is fine. Um, I don't want the code in the report itself. So you still have to sp spend eight pages talking about what you implemented. And you'll see this in academic papers. There's lots of papers where they implement something, but the paper isn't just like, here's my code. It's like, this is what I did and this is how I structured it. Here's a link to GitHub where you can see my source code. Here's maybe a snippet, like this part was challenging, so I'm gonna show you like how I did this. Yeah, yeah, so that's fine. And uh, that's part of evaluation because the performance is an evaluation criteria. So it satisfies the evaluation methodology. And the type of thing you're called are, is called measurements. So measurements are fine in papers like charts, data, like amount of time that things take and comparisons between how long things take. Is, 
Yeah. So don't stress yourself out about the number of papers. So like it depends a lot on the topic. Like my most recent paper, we did an implementation of something that didn't exist. And so we had, I don't know, seven citations and most of them were just trivial things, like little ideas that came from elsewhere because it was new. No one had done it before. Right. And so that's that's fine. And then other papers, you're like surveying something that there's entire conferences about. Then you, you might have 100 citations. I don't know. Like, but. Also, in citations, you don't have to include the page. Like, so that's more traditional in arts, but in engineering, you just tend to cite the paper. So it's like, this idea came somewhere from this paper. So if you cite the same paper five times, it's just one citation for all of those instances, where in other kinds of fields, you would cite it five different times because it's always on a different page or whatever. Okay, other questions about any any of the logistics of the course? Okay, good. All right, so what we'll do is uh, let's go take a 10 minute break um, and we'll come back at like maybe five, two around and then, uh, and then we'll do a quick lecture on just a small topic. Okay, uh, first off, there was a couple of good questions during the break, so I'll just say it for everyone. Uh, in terms of the project, there's no presentation, so uh, it's just the report itself. Uh, and in terms of group work, uh, you'll, it's one shared report amongst the whole group. All of your names are on it, everyone gets the same mark, and uh, you don't tell me like who did what on the project, it's just, it's a joint report with, with all of your names, everyone gets the same mark, uh, that type of thing. Okay, uh, is there any other questions before we jump in that maybe you thought of? Okay, good. So you can always, you can ask me anytime in front of any uh, lecture itself. Okay, so uh, for today's lecture, I'm going to cover something called Stride. It's really simple, uh, but uh, it's just a good thing to start with and then we'll uh, get into more detailed stuff uh, next lecture. Um, Okay, so I mentioned this earlier, but the, the main course of this goal is, you know, you'll all graduate in maybe two years. Uh, you'll have a master's of security, a lot of you, maybe a PhD, uh, maybe something else. And maybe you'll go work in industry, you'll show up on your first day of the job, and someone's going to hand you something and say, is this secure? That's your job, you're the security person. Um, and so the goal of the course, or what falls under methodologies is, um, how do you go about that? Or what are the things that you need to consider? Where do you start uh, when, when you do it? And so part of the problem we can think about first is what is it that you're actually given? Okay, so my mind always goes to one of two places, software and hardware. Okay, so software would be like some code, it could be an app, it could be an operating system, it could be some lower level kernel drivers, anything like that, firmware, it's all software. Uh, hardware, it could be some device, some interface, maybe some IoT device or something like that. Um, so these are, are some of the topics. But there's more to security than just uh, software and hardware. So w what are some other things that you might be given? Just shout, shout out. What are other things where someone might want to know the security of it and decide whether it's secure or not? That's not hardware or not software. Okay, so some sort of disaster. So that's more like, um, like physical security yeah. uh, in terms of things, yeah. So physical security is a big thing, right? So there's uh, surveillance as well. Uh, you can think of locks. You can think of a building, keys, who, who cuts the keys, who has the master key, how do you get all the access cards, who has access to the database, what about the mechanisms themselves, how much do they cost? Everyone has to carry around a card. You have card readers on every room. You have a lock on every room. Um, you know, you have security cameras. You have security officers. They're sitting downstairs. You know, so physical security is is definitely one. That's like a huge a huge component. Uh, we can also take governance policies and procedures. 
Okay, so policies, procedures are another thing. So a lot of organizations think about it. Uh, Concordia, there's changes in procedures. I don't know, like you have to use two-factor authentication now to access Moodle, for example. I think that's true for students now, uh, my understanding. But anyways, for professors it was. So that's a policy. Someone wrote that down. Someone had that idea. They think it solves a problem, and so they implemented it. Maybe the government, actually, they, they mandate some of this stuff uh, as well. So policies, procedures is a big one as well. Anything else? Okay, so authorization, access control. So this is also like kind of policy. It's more of the technical side of policy. Who has access to what? Um, how do you delegate? How do you do revocation? Let's say someone loses their credentials. How do you reset their accounts? All that type of stuff. Okay, so critical infrastructure, cyber physical systems. Uh, so that's sort of, sort of between software and hardware, like the kinds of systems where maybe software controls something that happens in real life. So like there's a train and the track will move, but the person issuing the command is not standing right beside it. They're you know in an office downtown Montreal and they're sending it over the internet. Okay, so that's like it's an actuated change, or people at Hydro Quebec are like rebalancing the grid or whatever they do. I don't know, and they're doing it with their computers. Uh, just issuing commands, but it's actually physically changing uh, the infrastructure. Cloud Say loud. Cloud it's cloud. Security. Yeah, cloud security. Yeah, so so that could be software. Uh, so like virtualization, um, that type of thing. Yeah, storage. Uh, it also goes to networks. So networks are aren't really covered yet. So like uh, like the networking aspect itself. And then on networks, you have protocols. So there's some cryptography, there's some packets, and how the packets are made, and what are in the headers of the packet, and you know how many layers of packets you have, all that stuff. So protocols, like not procedures, but like actual technical protocols. Uh, that's that's another thing. Cryptography. Uh, how do we do encryption functions? How do we hash functions? That kind of stuff. Data, data itself. So you can think about. Uh, privacy around data, data breaches, uh, accuracy of data, how do you know it's right, how do you know someone didn't tamper with it, who is the last person to change the data, what's the provenance uh, over the data, that type of thing. Yeah. Say loud. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch yeah. that. Oh, users? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So humans, users, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so human dimension is, is, uh, is also important. So you can look at if you have a system and no one wants to, it's the most secure thing, but no one can figure out how to use it, then no one will use it. Okay, so it doesn't matter how secure it is. Uh, social engineering, so like if you have, uh, the best way to get access to a server room isn't to break the lock or hack the database and change the access control so my card works, it's just to go to the receptionist dressed up like a janitor and say, okay, I'm here to clean the room and then they let me in. Okay, so that can sometimes work as well. Any other things? I think you've said everything. Yeah, so that would go under protocols and, and uh, procedures. Sorry, it would go under protocols specifically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see how we did. Um, so this also isn't meant to be comprehensive. I'm not saying this is everything and I didn't miss things and, or that cryptography is a protocol as opposed to data or something. It's just, the, the idea is just to give you a broad sense to think broadly that there's a lot of security in uh, different aspects. So networks, protocols, data, physical security, uh, organizational like policies, procedures, humans, uh, all of that type of stuff. Okay, now let's go back to methodology. So you look at this list and I tell you, um, you know, I have a cryptographic algorithm. It's your first day on the job, and I want you to determine whether it's secure or not. Okay? So you're going to use a methodology to try and figure that out. Okay? Now, your friend, you know, they get a job, and someone hands them a lock and says, I want you to figure out whether someone can, can break this lock. And someone else is given an application and, or a database, and they're like, is, you know, can you make sure that the data is secure and no one can breach the database, okay? Is the methodology that you use to evaluate the hash function going to be the same methodology that you use for the software that you use for the physical lock? Of course not, right? Okay, 
So this is my impossible task, which is I'm supposed to tell you how to secure all of these things using methodologies, right? But I can't possibly do it because every single one has a different methodology, okay? So what we'll do in the course is we'll look at some of them. I'll, we'll do a sampling of topics. And sometimes we'll look really high level and sometimes we'll do really low level, okay? So you'll see a mix of both. So for example, today I am actually going to give you a methodology that works for everything on this chart, okay? Now you might say that sounds hard to believe. The answer is, well, it's not going to go very deep, okay? It's going to be really simple, okay? So you can cover everything, but it's just going to be simple. So that's fine. And sometimes that's what you want, right? You just want to brainstorm ideas, that type of thing. Uh, something simple is fine. So we call this a high level methodology. So the next three lectures we'll spend on high level methodologies, okay? And then we'll do lower level methodologies. Actually, the third one can be used either high level or we'll do an example that's really low level. So we'll spend three lectures just doing this one methodology on this one subject to just show you the sort of contrast uh, between them, okay? But generally speaking, no single methodology is going to work for everything. Um, the second thing that makes it challenging is that before you think about the security of something, you really need to understand what you're looking at. Okay? So the example would be uh, there's people that are experts in identifying counterfeit money. Okay? They don't actually spend their time looking at examples of counterfeit money. They spend their time looking at the real thing. Right? They, they know what a real hundred dollar bill looks like. They know every security feature of it. They know what color the ink is. They know what the paper feels like. You know, they spend hours and hours studying the real thing in hopes that when something comes along that's not real, they'll, they'll sort of sense that there's something off about it and then work on like trying to pinpoint what exactly it is off. Okay. But if they didn't dump a lot of hours into studying the real thing, they're not going to be able to just pick up a bill and say fake, real, fake, real, fake, real. I mean, even if you give them a methodology, Okay, so methodologies like they don't work unless if you know what you're applying them to more or less. Okay, so you need a lot of domain knowledge, then you can think about security and then you can think about the methodology of security as well. Okay, so there's no easy trick. It's not like here's one simple trick and now you're a good security person. Uh, it's not going to be like that. Um, the other thing is that security is what we say necessary. It, okay, the claim that something is secure uh, is not a positive assertion. You can basically never say that something's secure. What you can say is, of all these attacks that I know about, none of them work on this thing, okay? Um, and so at the end of the day, there might be another attack that no one's dreamed up yet, and it does work on it, okay? So you can never like confidently say, you can't make a positive assertion like this is secure, okay? You can just say, I tried to break it every way I know how. It didn't break using the things that I tried to do. Uh, I followed my list and it, it came out the other end. And that's really all that you can say about it, okay? So nothing in this world is actually secure. It's just no one knows how to break it yet, okay? Doesn't mean maybe it will be secure forever. No one will figure out how to break it, but there always could be some future way of breaking it, okay? And that's also good news for you if you wanna work in the field of security because there's always going to be new things, uh, new things to do. Okay, so this is hardened against threat one, two, three, but there's some threat twenty-four that no one's thought of yet. So you're proving a negative, not a positive. Okay, so there's, like I say, there's no universal evaluation methodology that's going to work for all the things on our list. So you're going to go one of two ways. You're either going to try and find something that does work on the entire list, but it's going to be super high level or you're going to try and find something that works on a specific, uh, a specific thing on the list. Then you're going to learn a lot about that thing and then you're going to think about the security of the thing and, and, and things like that. So this course will be a mix of both. Okay, so we'll pick some topics off this list. Like, um, like I'll give you some methodology. So the next three lectures will be, we're going to talk about something called Stride today, very high level. Next class will be on evaluation frameworks. Then it will be on something called attack trees. Attack trees we'll do a deep, deep dive into. So we're going to apply it to a specific technology. I'm going to make you domain experts in that technology so that we can do a proper attack tree. Uh, then we're going to talk about things like there'll be an entire lecture just on usability. How do you figure it out? Things on social engineering. Uh, we'll have lectures on uh, policies and procedures. 
when we do usability, we'll pick up privacy as our example uh, for usability. And so these are also things that kind of fall through the cracks of the other courses that you're taking, right? So you're you're taking a lot of courses in like operating systems and cryptography and blah 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 blah, right? And so I'm going to try and have lectures on the kinds of things that you're not you're not going to see in in, in your other courses. Okay, so the high level methodologies aren't bad. Uh, the pro is that you can um, talk about lots of different things. Uh, and then the con of it is that it doesn't go very deep. Uh, so they're useful as a kind of starting point uh, if you're going to do some structured brainstorming and uh, if you want to like kind of organize your ideas. If you want to present your ideas to someone else, you want to have some structure to it so it's not just like a big long list. And so the three that we'll talk about this week, next week, and then the next couple lectures are Stride Evaluation Frameworks and Attack Trees. And so Stride is what we call a mnemonic, uh, which means that Stride stands for something. So the S stands for something, the T stands for something, the R stands for something. Okay. And so this is like the first thing that usually is taught in most security courses is here's an acronym to think about all the different security concepts. And the most basic one is CIA. Uh, you may have seen it before in other courses. And it's basically confidentiality. So secrets should stay secret. Integrity, you know, things shouldn't change or it should be detectable uh, if things change. And availability, meaning that if something shouldn't, a system shouldn't go down just because like something's not available. Okay, there should be some uh, resilience uh, built into it. So Stride is the same as CIA. Uh, the problem with CIA basically is just that, that people think it misses a couple things. So for example, authentication, it's not really a C, an I, or an A. It kind of feels like its own thing. So then people are like, well, what about CIAA? Or what about access control and authorization? That's not, it's a little different than authentication. Authentication is more like who you are, and access control is more about what you're allowed to do. So then it becomes CIAA. And so anyway, so Stride is like kind of a simplification of that, um, or a new way of looking at it. It has six things, including the C, I, and A, and I know you don't see the letter C, I, or A in uh, stride, but uh, you'll see why in a second. Um, it comes from Microsoft Research, uh, so someone there. Uh, Microsoft used it for a while. They had some tools as well, uh, but I think it kind of fell out of favor, and so I, I, don't, I don't know to what extent it's used today, but I think it's still useful to learn. Okay, so it's going to add properties for authentication, uh, authorization, and something called non-repudiation. I'll have slides about all of these. Non-repudiation basically is, can you say that you didn't do something when you actually did it? So like, I ordered something on Amazon, I actually got it, I, it's my shirt, I'm wearing it, and, but I'm going to go to Amazon and I'm going to complain and say, oh, it never showed up and I want my money back. Okay, so that's, that's repudiation. I'm repudiating that I actually did it. And then a security system could provide some form of non-repudiation, meaning that you can't later deny actions that you took. So like logs and signatures and things like that fall under that. Okay, so uh, you can see STRIDE stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege or escalation of privilege. Um, and the, the main thing about Stride as opposed to CIA is it's flipped around where the mnemonic is for the attacks, not the defense, okay? So there's the property you want, and then if the attacker breaks the property, we usually have the opposite word for that. So this is from the attacker. So for example, CIA, you'll see in the second column. So confidentiality is what you want. If you don't have it, you have information disclosure. Uh, integrity is what you want. If you don't have it, you have tampering. Uh, availability is what you want. If you don't have it, you have denial of service. Okay, so that's why it's just flipped around. And then we add authorization. Uh, the flip of it is elevation of privilege. We add uh, authentication, the opposite of is spoofing. And we add uh, non-repudiation, and the opposite of it is repudiation. Okay, so very briefly, spoofing is the idea that you say that you're someone that you're not. But it doesn't have to be a human. It could be a machine or something like that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, tampering is like you modifying things. Uh, repudiation is claiming to not have done an action when you actually did it. Uh, information disclosure is there's something that's confidential. It should say a secret, but it's being leaked. Uh, denial of service is, is preventing people access uh, to things that they need uh, or de degrading it. Uh, so making it really slow, for example, you don't have to cut it off entirely. 
and then elevation of privilege is that you you're only authorized to do something but you're able to do something more uh, than, than what you're authorized for so these examples are all out of the textbook that I cited. I'm not going to go line by line and explain all of them, so you can kind of look through them. I just want you to get the flavor of it so that you can at least distinguish, oh, that's an integrity thing or that's a spoofing thing. Um, so so it's, it's not about understanding all of these things, but I will, I'll talk a bit about a few of them. Okay, so spoofing, you have some examples of things that could be spoofed. Um, so in terms of software, it could be like a process that's running on your computer. Uh, it could be a file name. So maybe you're calling a library, a software library, and there's another library. Or let's say that you're just like, um, I install software, I use a Mac, so there's a thing called brew, homebrew. So I just type brew install, and then I put the name of what I want to install, okay? And there's other things like it for Linux and, and other operating systems that are, that are similar. And so let's say that I want to install, I don't know, Bitcoin, but the real Bitcoin doesn't have something on homebrew, but somebody else, they registered that name Bitcoin and they put like some malware uh, that's sitting there. So I just blindly type it in, I press enter and now I get malware or something like that, okay? So that, that would be like spoofing um, the name of something. Uh, and then uh, it can be machines themselves. So like IP address spoofing, I'll give you an example of that later. Uh, any identifier can basically be spoofed. There's no tamper proof hardware that says that just because I gave you know, a certain, like this SIM card has a number on it, it's unique. Does that mean I can't clone it uh, or, or simulate it or, or make you think that it's my phone or that type of thing? Um, so there's a lot of spoofing that applies. Some, sometimes there is secure hardware that, that tries to make it harder. Uh, people are spoofing, so social engineering will spend a lot of time on um, roles as well. So like, uh, you know, I dress up looking like a janitor, but that's not actually my role. So that's, that's a form of spoofing. Um, one thing I'll, I'll mention is uh, 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 this. So race conditions are important. Uh, they show up a lot. And then there's this acronym. Does anyone know what this stands for? Okay, so time of check versus time of use. Um, so this is where, um, so I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a kind of stupid example. Um, let's say you go to the club and you know to get into a bar in Montreal, you have to be over 18. That's fine you uh, are going to show your driver's license, okay? So there's a bouncer outside, you go up to the bouncer, you hand them the driver's license, and they look at the driver's license, they look at your face, they look and see that it matches the driver's license, and then maybe they look down to hand it back to you, and in that split second that they look down to hand it back to you, your friend jumps to where you were standing, your friend who's underage, right? And so the bouncer hands it back to your friend, and your friend goes into the bar. Okay, so that's how you get an underage person in, into the bar. Okay, would this happen in real life? No, why not? Because you can't jump that fast. Okay, probably. Maybe if there's a distraction or something like that, they, they turn and then they turn back, maybe you could pull it off. Probably not going to work. Okay, the, the better thing would be you just, your picture of your friend looks kind of like you or whatever, so that would be a different form of spoofing. Okay, but that's time of check versus time of use. So I checked you, so now the check is complete, you're authorized to do something, but before you take that action of entering the bar, and after I checked your ID, if you can do a swap in that, that window of time, then that's how you can get unauthorized things in, okay? Because you can't check everything all the time. It's not like a continual check. Like you're, you walk around the bar with your driver's license above your head, and everyone that walks by is always checking it, right? There's, there's a time when you check, and there's a time where you're granted the permission, and there's always a gap. Now in a computer, could that happen? Could someone jump in the position? Like the operating system checks something, they check the hash of a driver to make sure it's the right driver, and then, you know, then they transfer over and they do some other work, and in the meantime, you replace the driver, okay? And then they go back and now they're gonna use the driver and it's a completely different one, but they've already checked it, right? Could that happen in an operating system? Yes, okay? It's not like a physical space where there's not enough time. There's lots of time in an operating system to do these types of things, okay? Um, so anyways, a lot of bugs around spoofing that happen at like the software level follow this time of check, time of use uh, uh, type of condition, or it's also called race conditions. And uh, if you look through like vulnerability databases and CVEs and things like that, you'll see this acronym a lot because uh, there's a lot of, a lot of problems uh, with it. So you need to check something and then you need to lock it down. So that like, like now that I've checked it, like it's or actually what you should do is lock it down first 
then do your check, but make sure that no modifications can be made uh, after it. But it's hard to lock things down. Um, even physically on a computer, you can always unplug a hard drive and plug another one in or pull RAM out and put RAM in and things like that. Okay, tampering is like modifying things. So, you know, modifying a file, that's pretty obvious. Um, you can modify links or, or redirects, so it's sort of the same thing. Um, but links are useful uh, things to modify because you don't have to change so much about things. If you know, you can often like you can change a lot by just changing one link, right? If you can link from the real thing to a malicious thing, uh, then you can make wholesale changes without having to be like very very disruptive uh, or finding clever ways of of, of changing things. Um, so we'll see. Uh, when we talk about attack trees, we'll see, we'll spend a lot of time on, on how do you know that the server that you're talking to is the server that you want to be talking to, okay? And, and that the adversary didn't substitute their own uh, server in, uh, and so that if you're following uh, the, the, the direct or the connection, uh, that it's actually connecting to the right place. Uh, you can modify code, uh, you can modify data, that type of thing. So, uh, and then this isn't even comprehensive. Um, so there's, you could modify hardware, software. Uh, could you modify a human? Probably not, it's not gonna show up in social engineering, uh, unless if you like psychologically manipulate them, which we'll talk about as well. Um, that's usually not permanent. Uh, and uh, policies, procedures, you can definitely put back doors into policies that could be exploited later and things like that. So uh, tampering is, is not just a software, like technical uh, kind of thing. Uh, okay, so repudiation is this idea that you did something and then you're now saying, oh, it wasn't me. Okay, so I, I, I didn't actually click on that email. I didn't download that attachment. The malware that got on the Concordia network, isn't, that's not me, it wasn't me, someone else. I uh, ordered something, I, I didn't actually receive it, uh, that type of thing. Okay, and then information disclosure is sort of the privacy considerations. So are your secrets actually saying uh, secret? So if you have any uh, user data that's sensitive, personal information, uh, that could be exploited. We'll, we'll see an example called Heartbleed in a few lectures. Um, you can exploit, or you can um, like do SQL injection attacks and things like that in order to dump the contents of databases uh, that you shouldn't have access to. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, and then denial of service is something that we probably all know. So this is like where you try and bring down uh, a service. Uh, usually uh, you can think of it as a server. Uh, so you, there's a web server, you don't like it. It's a website, you wanna bring it down either to be malicious or because you don't like the content or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but that's not the only kind of denial of service. So you could do denial of service against say the operating system because it's running routine checks and you want to stop it from running that routine check. Um, also, uh, I might want to lock you out of your account. So I put your fake pass, I just start guessing random passwords. They're, I don't intend for them to be right. My, my belief is that they're actually wrong. Uh, but after 10 attempts, then, uh, then you'll be locked out. Or I pick up your phone and I start putting in random pins uh, and eventually it locks you out. And now congratulations, you can't use your phone for an hour. I don't know. Um, it can, uh, it can take the form of, these are all kind of like, you can think of as a flooding attack, where I'm, I'm just, I'm throwing lots of data at it uh, in order to, to, to manipulate it. So flooding's one way of doing it. There's other ways of doing it too. Like you can, like in really old times, you could ask a computer to like I I execute an infinite loop, and then it would just loop forever. It would tie up the computer. Um, those types of logic, logic bombs, sometimes they're called, uh, they still show up in weird ways. So sometimes you have protocols and there's ways to stick something in an instruction that ends up being recursive and uh, the designer didn't plan for it. And so the complexity of it just blows up and the computer can never get through it. Um, I work on blockchain systems, that's my main research area. And so there were a couple like things that were missed. Uh, they, these systems were really like locked down towards denial of service. Uh, but people found clever ways of, uh, uh, of exploiting uh, different commands that you could ask a blockchain system to do, and they would piece them together, and then all of a sudden it would take like an hour to go through a computation uh, or something like that. Okay, uh, so on denial of service, I'll just give you a concrete 
example of, of how it works because this, this example is nice because it touches on spoofing as well. So traditionally with denial of service, uh, if you want to think of it at a network level and taking down a server, uh, what you would do is you would just find the server and you would hit it with as much traffic as you can. Okay, so that's fine. So I'll just hammer it uh, with as much traffic. And if my bandwidth is greater than their bandwidth, then I could do, I could take the server down. Uh, if it's not as big as their bandwidth, I could at least degrade their performance so it's going to be slow uh, for other users. Uh, and so now what people will do is they'll hire a firm like Cloudflare or something like that, and they'll host the servers for them and all their contents for them. Uh, and so you as an individual will never have a bigger pipe than, than Cloudflare. Okay, so this, this approach just is not going to work anymore. So then we went through a phase of distributed denial of service. So in this case, you would ask a friend and everyone would hit the server at the same time. You could rent a botnet. So a botnet would be malware that's on a bunch of people's computers. These people don't know that it's on their computers. Uh, it's not that expensive to rent a botnet for an hour. Uh, and so you can direct the botnet, all the, the computers. They, they could be geographically distributed around the world. Uh, so even if you're going to try and filter at a country level or an ISP level, you can often get around it. Uh, so this would be a distributed denial of service. So that works pretty well. Uh, but anyways, the, the, more, um, uh, the more modern approach is something called amplification uh, denial of service. And so the way it works is, uh, uh, for, first off, just forget about denial of service by itself, okay? Just think of it like a web server. So usually the way you interact with a web server is you send it requests and then it sends you responses, okay? Now imagine a scenario where the what you're requesting is really short. The, the amount of data I have to use to make the request is short, but the amount of data that I get back is big, okay? So my idea for denial of service is, what if I could spoof my IP address? And so I'll ask this server, hey, send me this like big long data and I'll ask it over and over and over again. But I'm going to, instead of saying the packet's coming from me, I'm going to say it's coming from the target, Concordia. That's the server that I want to take down, okay? So what I'll do is I'll, I'll send these requests as fast as I can. And what I'm hoping is the server will turn around and it will send the responses, which are much bigger, at the same frequency. So this is like a bigger pipe right, a uh, bigger set of traffic to Concordia instead. And that way I've taken my like bandwidth and I've kind of blown it up by 10 if the responses are 10 times as big as, as the requests or I've blown it up by 100. And if these servers are kind of like backbone servers on the internet that have like some service that would work for this, uh, then, then they might have like a lot of bandwidth. And, and I can always do the distributed thing. I can get multiple servers and multiple friend SaaS servers and things like that. I can always uh, distribute it as well, okay? Now there's one problem with this picture and the picture is, the problem with it is it doesn't work, okay? Uh, the reason it doesn't work is because IP spoofing doesn't work the way that you might think it does. Uh, at least not over the protocol that we usually use on the internet, which is called TCP. And so TPC says that before you send your requests and they look at your requests and before they respond, you have to set the connection up, okay? So there's this handshake phase that you do first. Then once you're done the handshake, then you can start exchanging data, okay? So what this picture would look like is uh, before I can send my request, I have to say hello to the server. I can spoof that. So I can spoof the hello message. Then the server will say, hi there, you know, I received your hello, I'm saying hi back, and it will send it to the wrong party, uh, which is Concordia. But then Concordia is going to be like, what is this? Like, I never said hi to this server. I don't know what this is. Uh, I'm just going to drop the connection, okay? And believe it or not, if you just put your internet or your computer, like if you were able to disable all firewalls and things like that, the amount of like people that are saying hi to your computer at all times is like, is enormous, right? Like there's a huge amount of traffic that's just like, you know, we call it like background radiation noise or whatever, like on the internet where it's just like servers like like spoofed IP addresses or maybe malfunctioning servers or whatever. And there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that just it just gets dropped. OK. And the problem is you saying hello and they saying hello back is about the same size. OK, it's not that much bigger. So even if I can do this, I can do this redirect with the spoofing, uh, but I can't get that actual amplification. OK, so it's not going to work. OK. But 
the good news is that TCP isn't the only protocol. Okay, so there's other protocols, uh, including one called UDP. The idea of UDP is actually it's connectionless, so there's no handshake. So you use UDP when you just want to throw data at something as fast as you can. Uh, so like, for example, let's say it doesn't actually work this way amazingly anymore, but traditionally if you were watching YouTube or, or Netflix or something like that, you're streaming uh, video, they might send it to you over uh, UDP. Now TCP is so fast that it, it doesn't matter, but um, they might send it to you over UDP. The other thing TCP gives you is if you drop a packet, you'll re recognize that you dropped it, you'll request it again, then the server will send it again. But the idea is if you're doing video, it doesn't matter because you've moved past that frame in the video. So if you get it late, like it will just go fuzzy, like lower resolution for a minute and then it will skip past and it will go back. So you know you don't want to recover those those uh, lost packets or anything like that. Um, so anyway, so but UDP is this this like connection list for things that are fast where you don't want to go back and forth saying hi, you know, send three messages back and forth before you actually get to the data. Okay, so would this work for UDP? The answer is yes. So mechanically, it will work. Okay, so if I spoof a UDP, first off, the very first message can be the request. I don't have to say hi first. Okay, I can spoof an IP address. And then the response will go over UDP to Concordia as opposed to coming back to me. Okay. So the final like missing piece is, is there actually like a server that will do this for me? Is there some server that's actually running something on UDP where whatever we're doing over UDP, I can give it short requests and it gives me big long responses. Okay. And so the answer is yes, there are a bunch of them. And right now we're in this like, period of time where we're going around and turning all these things off because people have realized that's really bad. And people go hunting for like the most little obscure things that you can do in order to do these amplification attacks. So we're, we're in the process of like shutting off all of these servers. But the one that started it all uh, was uh, something called NTP. So this is a network time protocol. Uh, the basic idea of it is that you can ask the server what time it is and it will tell you. Okay, it's sort of useful. Uh, you can ask a bunch of servers and take them the median time or whatever. So it's just something that servers have on by default. You don't want to say hi, hi, back, and then ask what time it is. You just want to say what time is it and they send it to you. Okay, so they run it over UDP. And it's implemented on basically by default, it used to be, on all servers, including real like mainframe servers like that are on the backbone, like Rogers and Bell and like, they're like hardcore servers, okay? So these are servers that have a lot of bandwidth, okay? Uh, and they, they'll be running NTP. Now, one thing you can do with NTP is you can basically say, hey, can you send me like the last, I don't know, 50 people that connected to you, okay? And that's a pretty short thing. I just say, give me the list and here's a number of how many people I wanna send. Okay, that's all I have to send. And then I get back this big response that's like, here's all the IP addresses of all the people that I've talked to you know, most recently or whatever it is, okay? And so in terms of amplification, uh, that request is about maybe, the, the response is maybe 100 times bigger uh, than the request uh, in terms of data, okay? So what I do is I spoof my IP address to Concordia and I go to NTP and I say, give me the list, give me the list, give me the list, give me the list, give me the list. And then it's a mainframe computer, so it's able to say, here's the list, here's the list, here's the list, just as fast as I'm asking for it. The problem is the list is 100 times bigger than what I'm asking for, okay? So the, the amount of traffic that's being directed to Concordia is 100 times what I'm able to put out as an individual, okay? So quickly, obviously, people turn this off. So NTP, either they disable it completely or they turn off this, like, get list function. But now, like, everyone goes and they're like, well, is there some other... Like, like, let's go through every single thing in the NTP protocol and forget about NTP. What about like, I don't know, DNS or DNSSEC is really bad because uh, DNSSEC is like the secure version of DNS. DNS runs over UDP and with DNS security, you have all these certificates and cryptographic keys. So you can be like, tell me about Google. That's really short. And they'll be like, here's a certificate. Here's a certificate. And each of them have like a 40, 96 bit key in it. And it's a big chain of certificates that goes from the site to the certificate authority to the root and all that type of stuff, okay? And so anyway, so so anyway, these are this is sort of like the modern version of denial of service, uh, which is an amplification attack. Okay, the last part of stride, uh, the E in stride is uh, escalation or elevation of privilege. 
And so this is basically like you breaking out of what you're permissioned to do, okay? So the most common example would be uh, a lot of operating systems now, they don't run with administrative rights. So like you can't go in and just change like system files or you can't uh, install software that wants to change system files without authorizing with a username and password, okay? Um, but if, say you were to install something that didn't ask the user to give it super permissions to install it, but somehow there was a flaw in the operating system that it exploited and it was able to change system files even though it wasn't, even though you're not a super user, you're not a mint on your computer, then we would say, oh, that's an escalation of privilege attack. Okay? So again, if you go through the CVEs or like all the common vulnerabilities and the list of them, you'll see escalation of privilege everywhere. Okay? It could be as bad as I go to a website and somehow whatever's happening on that website, it breaks out of the browser, which it shouldn't be permission to do, and then it breaks out of the operating system and then it's all of a sudden it's, it's modifying system files just because I went, you know, because it had a weird font on a website that I went to or whatever. Of course, it's all like cleverly engineered and you need, you know, zero day vulnerabilities all the way down in order to, to make these things uh, happen. Uh, but that's the, the, the sort of the goal, the attacker's kind of goal, okay? So what you'll do with Stride is you'll pick, like you go to work or whatever and they hand you you know, whatever it is. At, at the very least, it's a super high level methodology that you can at least say, okay, what are the spoofing attacks, right? What is, what's the considerations around authentication? Maybe it's not relevant to your particular thing. What are the tampering attacks? What are the repudiation attacks? What's, what, what do I have to say about denial of service? What do I have to say about escalation of privilege, okay? So it's at least a useful framework for you to start thinking about things. It gives you a couple starting points uh, you can brainstorm ideas. You can also present it back so to your client or whatever. You can say, okay, here I've broken all the security things I can think of in terms of, of these like six categories and they can skip to the ones that they care more about or, or that type of thing, okay? But is Stride going to allow you to tell that a hash function is broken or find a zero day vulnerability in an operating system? No, of course not, okay? It's very high level, it's just you know, it's, it's meant to get you thinking ab about it. Uh, it's meant to give you kind of structure. So you can't, you can't lean on these high level methodologies too heavily, um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's useful enough, okay? So it, it's applicable basically to anything that you wanna you test the security of. The downside is it doesn't go deep at all, and it's limited by your own knowledge of it. Right, so if you don't know how authentication works inside and out in whatever you're analyzing, you're not going to find spoofing attacks uh, with it. Uh, but it is useful for uh, just brainstorming and kind of organizing uh, what your ideas are. Okay, is there any questions about this? Nope. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, and uh, we'll break a little early. I think I get messed up because this time slot's not the one that I'm used to teaching in. I think we still have half an hour. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll see you all next class.